I'm Dr. Mark Attala, and I want to welcome you to the sixth chapter of Schultz and Schultz's History of Modern Psychology. Today we'll be talking about the antecedent influences for functionalism, which is basically about Charles Darwin, his book The Origin of Species, uh, his influence on psychology, his cousin Francis Galton, and his work with mental inheritance. But let's begin. Uh, well, the chapter begins with a vignette about Darwin visiting the London Zoo in 1838 to see Jenny, who was an orangutan, who wore clothes, drank from a cup, used a spoon, and understood language. And to the right is a contemporaneous drawing of Jenny. Now, Darwin's important because he would change the focus of psychology from the structure of consciousness to the function of consciousness. And that creates a school called functionalism, which is concerned with how the mind functions and how it adapts an organism to its environment. Functionalism is important because it's the first uniquely American school of thought in psychology. Now, Wundt is a German and Titchener was British and their systems were seen as too restrictive. Let's start by talking about the inevitability of evolution. Aristotle recognized the similarities among different species, so that the human hand was analogous to the wing of a bird or the fin of a fish, but he did not suggest that species might evolve or change over time. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck is a French naturalist, and he formulated a behavioral theory of evolution. Now, his idea was that an animal's body could be modified in order to adapt to its environment, and those modifications were inherited by succeeding generations. So, a giraffe developed a long neck over generations of having to reach higher and higher for leaves. Now, it should be pointed out, since your book doesn't, that Lamarck was wrong because he thought that organisms passed on environmental adaptations during their lifetime rather than predetermined genetic information. But he was an influence on Darwin, and it's a clever idea. Now, Charles Lyell, who was a friend of Darwin's, uh, was a British geologist, and he came up with this idea that the Earth is actually very, very old. Uh, he was, uh, as I said, he was a friend, and in his book, Principles of Geology, he coined the terms that we still use for geologic eras like Paleozoic and Mesozoic. Now, your book is wrong, though, and he did not publish Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation in 1844. It was originally published anonymously and then later turned out to be written by Robert Chambers, who was a Scottish journalist. Darwin, however, believed that the book, which was a bestseller on the transmutation of species, prepared the public for his own theory of evolution, which was based on natural selection. The zeitgeist was transformed by the Industrial Revolution, and people were eager to put their faith in science, and so society was ready for Darwin's theory. Now, Darwin was born in 1809, into a wealthy and socially prominent family. He was boisterous and a mischievous child, and he started by going to the University of Edinburgh to study medicine, but he thought medicine was dull. Then he spent three years at Cambridge University to become a minister, and academically, Darwin thought it was a waste of his time, but socially, he said it was the best time of his life and he spent his time drinking, singing, and playing cards, which is not a bad way to spend your time when you think about it. He joined the voyage of the HMS Beagle, and that went from 1831 to 1836. He was the naturalist, the shipboard naturalist, and he was almost rejected for that job because the captain, Robert Fitzroy, didn't like the shape of his nose. Fitzroy was a fan of phrenology and put a lot of faith in it. Now, the ship, the Beagle, literally went around the world, and Fitzroy wanted a naturalist on board to find evidence supporting the biblical theory of creation. After the voyage, Darwin comes home, marries his cousin Emma, and went to work on writing. By 1842, he had a 35-page outline of his evolutionary theory, and by 1844, he had expanded it out to 200 pages. Now, he was hesitant to publish until he received a letter from Alfred Russell uh, Wallace. Now, Wallace 
was a poor, young, struggling naturalist uh, working in the East Indies. And in 1858, he wrote Darwin outlining a theory of evolution that was essentially Darwin's theory. Now, <clears throat> he wrote up his theory while he was recovering from malaria, and the whole idea came to him in three days. Uh, Rawls wrote to Darwin asking for his opinion and help in getting his theory published. Now, the effect on Darwin of receiving Wallace's letter was, in Darwin's words, words, almost paralyzing. Darwin told his friend Lyle, who is the geologist, uh, that helping Wallace would forfeit Darwin's credit for originating evolutionary theory. So he wasn't sure what to do. And Lyle came up with a compromise, which would acknowledge both Wallace and Darwin. And that was a joint presentation at a meeting of the Linnaean Society on July 1st, 1858. So they presented both Wallace's paper and excerpts from Darwin's forthcoming on the origin of species. Now, Wallace never expressed any bitterness for not receiving more recognition. He said that Darwin created a new science and he wrote a friend that he, meaning Wallace, could never have approached the completeness of Darwin's book with its vast accumulation of evidence. Well, there was a lot of controversy about On the Origin of Species. Darwin's central idea is this idea of natural selection, that survivors are the ones who've made successful adaptations to their environment. In, in brief, species that cannot adapt do not survive. Now, he developed this theory after reading Essay on the Principle of Population by economist Thomas Malthus. Now, you may have heard the term Malthusian solution, which is basically that there isn't enough food to go around, and so most people live under near starvation conditions, and only the most forceful, cunning, and adaptable will survive. So you can see the influence there. Thomas Henry Huxley emerged as a vigorous defender of Darwin. Huxley was an ambitious biologist, and his, a popular, his popular appeal was immense, especially among the working classes. Now, the British Association for the Advancement of Science had a debate at Oxford University about evolution. 700 people attended, and Huxley defended Darwin, who was too sick to attend. Captain Fitzroy from the Beagle also showed up, waving a Bible over his head, and expressing his profound sorrow and regret for providing Darwin with the opportunity to collect support for his theory by traveling on the Beagle. Fitzroy later killed himself and uh, Darwin sent the, his widow money. Darwin's later work, well, he follows up with The Descent of Man in 1871, where he provides evidence for human evolution. Many people were shocked by this book uh, and there's a famous quote where someone said, let us hope that it is not true, but if it is, let us pray that it will not become generally known. Then the following year, the expression of emotions in men and animals. And his idea here was that facial expressions and body language were innate and uncontrollable manifestations of internal states. So that pain was accompanied by a grimace and pleasure by a smile. So you could pe read people's emotions on their face. Modern biologists have retraced Darwin's travels and found how species have evolved to deal with changing environmental conditions. So the book provides examples of research done with finches, uh, which Darwin wrote about extensively, some other birds, as well as mice. But what about Darwin's influence on psychology? Really four points to this. The first is a focus on animal psychology and a continuity between the species. Psychologists came to realize that the study of animal behavior was vital to their understanding of human behavior. Second, a focus on function rather than the structure of consciousness. Psychology came to be interested in how consciousness functions in adapting people to their environment rather than studying its structure. The third uh, influence is methodology and data from many fields. Now, Darwin's data came from a variety of sources, including geology, archeology, span demography, observation, and pigeon breeding. Last, 
a focus on the measurement of individual differences and variation among members of the same species. If each generation was identical, then evolution could not occur. As psychologists looked for ways that minds differed, they would propose techniques for measuring those differences. Let's move on now to Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton. Galton had a very high intelligence and a wealth of ideas. He studied fingerprints, fashion, the geographical distribution of beauty, weightlifting, and the effectiveness of prayer, and invent invented a teletype printer, a lockpick, and a periscope for looking over crowds. Now at 16, he began a program to become a physician, and he decided to try all of the medications in the pharmacy, so he'd have an idea what they did, starting with the letter A. His idea was to go from A to Z, but he stopped at C with croton oil, which is a powerful laxative. Now he didn't really wanna be a doctor, but uh, his father wanted it, uh, wanted him to become a doctor, and so he stopped studying medicine when his father died. He went on to Cambridge University for uh, mathematics and graduated from there and then became an explorer. He went to Africa and he received a Royal Geographic Society medal for his explorations there. Galton found exploring to be exciting and invigorating and wrote a popular travel guidebook, The Art of Travel, that's been republished a number of times uh, over the previous century. Galton also studied meteorology and designed instruments to plot weather data. Uh, he developed the type of weather maps that we still use today. He also was fascinated, well actually, because uh, his cousin, Char cousin Charles Darwin published on the origin of species, Galton became fascinated with the social implications of Darwin's theory. So let's talk about that, this idea of mental inheritance. In 1869, Galton writes Hereditary Genius, and his theory was that eminent men have eminent sons. Basically, he showed that great scientists were likely to born into families of other great scientists. He doesn't consider the influence of a superior environment, better educational opportunities, or social connections in making people eminent. Galton also finds founds the science of eugenics, and he argued that humans, like farm animals, could be improved by artificial selection. Now, Galton himself had no children, which is pretty funny when you think about it. But he didn't just coin the term and walk away, but established a journal. He published a journal, Biometrica, and established the eugenics laboratory at University College in London. Galton is also famous for his statistical methods. Now, it was Adolf Quetelet, pardon my high school French, actually Quetelet is actually Belgian. Uh, he was the first person to use the normal curve with biological and social data. Now, Quetelet showed that when the height of 10,000 subjects were plotted, they approximated a normal curve. In his phrase, the average man reflected the finding that most physical measurements cluster around the center of a distribution. Now, Galton says that any human characteristics could be described by two numbers, the mean and the standard deviation. So the average value of the distribution and the range of variation around that average value. Carl Pearson, who was a student of Galton's, developed the correlation coefficient, or Pearson's R, if you're familiar with that. And he chose the R symbol for the correlation uh, in recognition of Galton's discovery of the idea of regression to the mean. Cattell, who we'll talk about later, uh, coins the term mental test, but Galton originated the concept. And Galton thought that intelligence was a sensory capacity, so that the higher the intelligence you had, the higher the level of sensory functioning. And he got this idea from John Locke, who thought that all knowledge comes through the senses, so that if you're very knowledgeable, you should have very good senses. That's the, the logic that Galton was using. So Galton develops a number of instruments, like the Galton whistle, which is in the picture there, uh, reaction times to lights and sounds, weights to measure muscle sensitivity, etc. He established the Anthropomorphic Laboratory in 1844 at the International Health Exhibition. In over six years, he collected data from 9,000 people 
on 17 tests. Now people would pay a small admission fee and then an attendant would record their progress through the tests. Although the data was reliable, meaning that it showed consistency, it wasn't valid and sensory capacity is not correlated with intelligence. So I wanna make that clear. Also compared to modern data, the rate of development in Galton's time seems to have been slower for people. Now he was interested in a lot of other stuff too. He did some work on word association and he was impressed with the influence of unconsciousness, the unconscious on his thought processes. He did mental imagery research and found that it was normally distributed in the population. What he would do is he would have people um, try to recall a scene such as their breakfast table that morning. And he found that the imagery described by women and children was particularly concrete and detailed. He studied the power of prayer and uh, found that it was of no use to doctors, meteorologists, or ministers. He was also interested in counting, and when he had his portrait made, he sat and counted the artist's, the artist's brush strokes and found that it took 20,000 brush strokes to do his portrait. That's a little OCD, I think, but uh, counting's a common thing with that. Galton also assigned numeric values to odors, such as peppermint, and then learned to add and subtract by thinking about them. And he published this in his article, uh, Arithmetic by Smell, and that was published in the inaugural issue of Psychological Review. So those peppermint sticks to the right uh, add up to 11, uh, which is my little joke. Let's finish out by talking about animal psychology. Now Darwin works, Darwin's work act as, acts as a stimulus for the development of animal psychology. And we'll talk about two British researcher, researchers here. Uh, George John Romains was a British physiologist and he formalized and systematized the study of animal intelligence. In his book in 1883, he creates this mental ladder of functioning. So what animals could use tools which exhibited memory, etc. And he comes up with this, uh, this idea of introspection by analogy. And in this approach, investigators assume that the same mental processes that occur in their mind also occur in the minds of animals. So you th essentially the idea of introspection and of, by analogy is to think about animals thinking. What is the animal thinking? That's not scientific whatsoever. Um, but on the positive side, Remains thought cats were the most intelligent, uh, or one, among the most intelligent animals. He thought that monkeys and elephants were more intelligent. But I would have to agree with this, because cats got humans to store uh, grain in order to attract mice that they could chase. And that's pretty intelligent abstract thinking in my, uh, in my mind. Now, C. Lloyd Morgan was Romaine's designated successor in animal psychology, and he develops this law of parsimony, which means that an animal's behavior must not be interpreted as the outcome of higher mental processes when it can be explained in terms of lower mental processes, which is not the most parsimonious definition. Morgan is the first scientist to conduct large-scale experimental studies with animals but he later went into university administration, which is the dark side. And the future of animal psychology uh, moves from England to the United States. So that's chapter six, and thanks for listening.